good to be together this morning as we continue through the series we began not long ago, just looking at the works of the flesh there in the letter that Paul wrote to Galatians. We're just going to kind of dive into each individual um, this description of areas that we need to watch out for and, and have a, um, a sense of soberness, watchfulness. Really, these are the kinds of things that we think about when... Um, Peter reminds us that the devil is a roaring lion seeking to devour us and to be watchful. Uh, sometimes that's a bit misleading. Right? We say, well, okay, I'm going to watch the devil. Okay, well, what do I look for? Uh, these are the things we look for. Uh, these are the individual aspects and in how he works. He works through these temptations of the flesh. And so this is one area that no doubt when we think of um, being sober-minded, watching out for the wiles of the devil... He's going to work his way in this area. It's just uh, it's uh, labeled impurity. Uh, it comes right after the first uh, description there. We looked at immora- immorality, which was essentially just um, guarding our, our temptation in the area of sexual purity. And this really goes a little bit deeper. It comes to this as really guarding our minds and making sure our minds are filled with the proper um, guidance and, and thoughts that will enable us to fight accurately and uh, efficiently against those temptations. And so guarding our hearts is very, very important. And we're going to look at some passages. Hopefully it will help us and encourage us to do that. But there in Proverbs chapter 4, there in verse 23, it gives us this concept that this is the battleground for ultimate temptation. It's going to be the, the things that are our heart. Really, it talks about just really it's what we desire, what we, what we allow ourselves to develop kind of um, a leaning towards, a, a taste for, a, um, a, a tendency to crave or, or, or to uh, feel um, uh, comforted by. All these kinds of things that we find security, we find safety, we find satisfaction. Because we, actually, we actually have to uh, train our hearts to crave the right things. We can't just leave it untouched and leave it unguided. Left alone, it will be uh, lean towards things that are going to be unhealthy for us spiritually. And so that's why essentially what we need to do is, is guard the leanings of our, of our heart. And by, by that he's saying, watch out what we put in. Uh, there's an old saying, what is it, garbage in, garbage out. What you put in is usually what comes out. And usually that's why he naturally is going to go right to the heart. He's talking about what kinds of things that we kind of have a mindset of just guarding with all fierceness to make sure that we do put in the right kinds of uh, ideas and thoughts and, and really training our hearts to desire the things that God wants us to desire and uh, that we can make sure that we watch out for anything that, that lures us and, and tempts us in an opposite way. And that's where we come to this word uh, impurity. We talk about the word impurity. Um, it's an interesting word. It actually, uh, in its original um, definition has reference to dirt or dirtiness, actually in a physical sense. So when you think about uh, having impure, impure ideas, you think of dirty thoughts, or the things that we recognize that, that we would recognize as something that would not be conducive of purity, of righteousness, of clean, right thinking. But if anything that kind of pollutes the mind and pollutes the heart, would, that would kind of lead it more towards uh, sinful. F- fleshly desires, are things that we need to avoid, and is watching out and watch out for that. In fact, when, when this word was used um, in, the, in some of the Greek translations of the Old Testament, it actually was translated there in the idea of anything that would make you unfit to approach God. When it talks about things that made us defiled or impure, that word impurity had its concept of why it was something we should work to uh, avoiding it because if we allow it to uh, taint us it does affect our willingness to be able to be accepted by God so there in Leviticus chapter 22 if we just read a couple passages there in Leviticus kind of gives us this idea uh, that this is what Paul has in mind when he's kind of uh, warning us about this so again something we look at these 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 words overlap like well what's the difference between immorality and impurity is it is an immorality impure Yes, but the, the idea is really what's the origin or the root of what causes us to commit immorality. And it is an impure heart, contents that we allow to pollute our desires and, and 
the affections that we should have. So notice in Leviticus chapter 22, uh, beginning in verse 3, he, he gave this concept to early Israel uh, that they were to make sure that they kind of had a clean concept of their appropriateness and being able to be able to approach God effectively. And so in verse 3 of Leviticus 22, he says, Say to them, if any man among all your descendants throughout your generations approaches the holy gifts which the sons of Israel dedicate to the Lord, well, he has an uncleanness. That person shall be cut off from before me. I am the Lord. And there he lists all kinds of various specific areas where you were considered unclean. But that's the, I, the idea. And so it makes sense why Paul would list this as a warning for you and I. Because this would, this would make us unfit to approach God. As we think about this, why is this so important? Because God, again, he's looking at the heart. Even though I might be in the right place, right? You say, well, here, God wants me to be in the first day of the week here, uh, uh, honoring God, singing these songs, listening to the scripture. Well, where's the heart? If the heart is corrupt, what we're doing really makes no difference. We're still unfit, right? We need to make sure that that heart, the intent of what's flowing through our desires, that that is, has a free-flowing uh, avenue of allowing the fountain of God's goodness, that fountain of God's purity, his ideas, his desires are kind of cleansing us in that way that then we are going to be naturally bent or pursuing holy kind of living and uh, a lifestyle. Um, so as we look at this, we're going to just look at three uh, specific areas because eventually this did come to be used as an, in a moral uh, application we're going to look at here um, this morning. As so we think about the, the, the moral implications of being fit to uh, worship God, fit to approach God. Uh, there are three concepts that we need to be watching out for. Um, one, it says it's the, it's the quality of that which is soiled and dirty, referring to the mind. Uh, yes, what we think about, what we allow ourselves to dwell on, what we allow ourselves visually to take in. All of these things are things we need to have uh, a conscious effort to guard and make sure we're allowing the, the appropriate things, yes, to flood our, uh, our hearts and, and, and what influences our hearts. In fact, if we would turn over to uh, Romans chapter 1, just read a few verses there. Romans, the, the first chapter, talks about the influence there of impurity and the, our need to watch out and guard against it. Um, Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 24. Notice it says, therefore God gave them over, notice in, in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. The next series of verses we talked about what it is that they actually were doing, what sinful acts they were doing. It was influenced by the fact that he, they let their minds be open to anything and everything. They, had, they really had no censor. They had no, no filter. They didn't filter anything out. Whatever was there, they engaged in it. They, they allowed it to come in. And notice he says that God saw that that was kind of where their minds were. Remember, almost kind of uh, triggers another thought of what, what causes God's uh, displeasure. Remember, what was the description, what was the under, overlying uh, area of most of creation that caused God to look to Noah and to save really his family and make a remnant of the individual that would obey God? It says, what was the most... Uh, the, the description, most of the thoughts of people's minds, most of their thoughts were evil continually. They, they did, didn't matter to them. They, they didn't have any, any sense, well, should I be thinking about this or should I not? They didn't care. They just didn't care. And that led to a full floodgate of all kinds of things that were t evil and inappropriate. And they just feasted on it and allowed it to dwell. And it no doubt led to the, the way that it corrupted um, their, uh, their, their way of just living. And was displeasing before God. But notice, that's, that's the, the way this leads. So notice there in Romans chapter 1, in verse 24, it says, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their heart to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That is, all the thoughts of the pure way that God would have them to think. And so it does, it makes, it makes a difference. Um, 
Uh, you know, it, I think it sets a precedent that uh, sometimes we, we can maybe um, uh, forget um, that, yes, while we need to be at the right places, we need to be doing the right things, we need to be engaging in correct behavior. But most importantly, this is that proper reminds us, let's make sure that we're, we're having the proper influx of what fills the, 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 the innermost part of our being, the part that God actually looks at first. Remember, that's maybe a good motivation for us to keep ourselves on the right path with these things and to guard ourselves from being influenced by these things. Because again, remember uh, that, that famous uh, illustration of Samuel looking for the right person to anoint as king. He was looking visually, had a visual direction of what seemed appropriate, and yet he said, no, God is actually not even looking at any of these things. He looks directly at the heart. And so... Probably most important than anything else, we make sure that this is the primary area that we let God's righteousness to reign supreme. And we not allow that place uh, to be infiltrated by the enemy, the devil, with these kinds of thoughts that corrupt and pollute uh, where our minds and our thoughts should be centered. Um, As we continue reading, notice that it uh, continues to take shape. As we continue reading the book of Romans, and it knows what kind of, what, what, uh, to what sense of, of rebellion and disobedience did a corrupt heart lead? Well, it leads to all kinds of things. As we drop down to Romans chapter 1, and notice uh, in verse 28, Romans chapter 1, verse 28, it says, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over notice to a depraved mind. First, he gave them over in their minds. In other words, they'd set in their minds, we are not going to fill our minds with that which is pure. We're, we're, we got our own direction, what we, 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 we have a desire for. And God gave them over, which he realized there's no stopping you now. It just opened the floodgates, and he just, you're, you're, you're so bent on uh, continuing down that path. And he said, it's just going to take you further and further away from anything that would be beneficial to, you, to, to, to him, to be acceptable to them. And it says, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And notice, to do. Keep that in mind. That's a great passage to underline. What makes you do? Your mind. What makes you disobey? Your mind. What makes you uh, rebel? Your mind. (laughs) Again, that's why the mind, the heart, and the body, they go together. And so we have to have have a healthy behavior. We need to have a healthy healthy mind. Make sure that that mind is being uh, flooded properly with the right things that would direct our behavior. So he says, he to do those things which are not proper, being defiled, or being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, and merciful. And then though they know the ordinance of God... That those who practice such things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but also notice, give hearty approval. What's going on in their mind? That's what's going on in their mind. There's nothing stopping their minds. That's why they do them. They give hearty approval because in their minds, there's nothing that would trigger. Maybe I shouldn't think that. But we need something, and then we're going to talk about that a little bit in our Wednesday Bible class. We're moving on from the concept of love from a pure heart. The goal of our instruction, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Second is a clear conscience, a good conscience. Which we need to develop something in our hearts that triggers, that goes off and says, wait a minute, warning lights are coming on. There's red flags all over this. And I probably shouldn't be thinking, dwelling, going, leaning. We need to have things that make us turn the right way. And the devil is going to put kinds of things in our minds that that turns us away so that we uh, are going to weaken in our defenses to be able to stand the right way. And so that's going to be our challenge right away. I'm sure you realize, well, maybe the first is good luck in a world saturated with this stuff, right? Like, wow, it's a battle. It's a battle. And that's why the first thing I think we need to recognize is, first of all, uh, you're right, you're right you know, as long as we're in this world, we're going to be just polluted. It's just polluted. I mean, everywhere you walk around, I mean, you just, where are you going to get away from it? I mean, yeah, we, we, we do our very best, obviously, to limit the, 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 the amount of flood that comes into our personal homes and our personal time. But you know, Jesus himself, remember what he said? 
He said, I don't tell you to go out of the world. He said, that's not how we're going to defeat this. There's no place you can escape out of the world where you're going to be away from this. He said, but I want the word. He said, I want to sanctify you with my word. Our greatest ally to fight this is not, maybe I need to find a great place where, the, where, where, where none of this goes on. No, I need to fill my heart with the proper things that will fight my mind and equip my mind to not let it influence me. The word will do that. That's how, think about how strong the word is. That if I put the word into my heart, if I d- embed it deep into the recesses of, of my innermost being in my heart. Remember what, what the psalmist said, your word I've hid in your, my heart that I might not sin against you. He knew he had to hide it in his heart. You hide it there and you put as much of it as it can and it will guard you and it will protect you and it will uh, be that leaning uh, influence even when, yes, we're tempted with all kinds of these ideas and these thoughts that we, as we talk to others and their hearts are polluted with it and uh, they, they advertise it and they uh, engage in it. The way we battle this is not just, well, I need to just retreat somewhere on some island where it's never going to be around me. Uh, that's not how we fight this. Uh, we can Obviously, we can limit with choices we make, and we can do that. There's obviously wisdom with, with that. We don't want to just openly just, as we said, don't give the devil an opportunity. Just, just, just openly just welcome him in every avenue. But we also have to be realistic. And uh, where are you going to find a place where you're just going to be, uh, where the devil can't get you? Where the devil can't find a way to, to get to your, your mind or try to tempt your mind. Jesus was in a wilderness and the devil found him. Jesus was all alone and the devil found him for 40 days. And he was dwelling on the word. And that's what got him through it was he had the word so saturated in his heart. He allowed that word to fight off those tempting thoughts that the devil was trying to infiltrate him with. So that's what we need to watch out for. And that's what we need to try to... Uh, arm ourselves with what are we thinking, what are we dwelling on. Uh, there, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, here's our greatest ally of just flood our minds, saturate our minds with as much good and as much of God's purity and as much of his uh, character that we possibly can. So notice what he says there in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, there in verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. If there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. In other words, it's not it's that idea of dwelling. It's more than just, well... Uh, let, it, let it just kind of pass through us. It's the idea of really just kind of having the intention of wanting to sat- saturate is the idea. Almost the idea that, that, you know, if you just let something sit for long enough, you, know, you let, it, let a T-shirt, you know, sit there in you know, a bucket of water and you pull it out and it's not just going to be wet. You're going to wring that thing out. It's going to be saturated. You know, what's coming out of it is what's in it. And that's the idea that what do we want to come flowing through our actions? A saturated heart. That's literally saturated with those overflowing, that wellspring of Jesus' purity and his goodness. When we saturate that, guess what? It's going to come out. It's going to work through us. So we have to be very, very uh, diligent and vigilant about this. So it says, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell, saturate your heart on these things. And he says, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Notice, then how do we do it? Practice. Practice. I can't practice when I don't have the strength to emulate. You're strengthening, you're arming your heart to give you the strength to be able to even do these things. Because we're going to need that ability to overcome the temptation and the nature of temptation, how it works on us. Another passage, um, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And note verse 1, how much of this talks about what we allow our, our minds to be centered on. He talks about the more, that if we can win that battle, then we can win the battle of, of our, our actual conduct and how we um, 
utilize ourselves uh, to be righteous in living and in our conduct. But notice Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Notice he says, but immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. So notice those two words. There's two separate words. They, do, they, they, they overlap in some areas, but they're very separate ideas. Notice he says, Immoral, immorality should not be named among us, but neither should impurity. And when we're talking about impurity, we're talking about what's flowing, what's, what's having access, what's, what are we giving the green light to, to constantly just run through the avenue of our thoughts and our minds. He says, don't let impurity even be named as something that we are leaning towards, that we are permissive about. That we actually know let's be actively trying to fight against letting it get to us is really the concept. So don't let immorality be named, but also no, no impurity. Um, or agree might even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And notice, and there must be no, here's the word, no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting. Well, how do we guard against that? Again, usually what, even what Jesus said, he said, out of the heart, what speaks? mouth out of the heart the mouth speaks you ever had that we all have this most right we, we can plan right we, we try to pre-plan what we say sometimes and oftentimes usually you know, it's instinct right instinct takes over and usually instinctively what we say reveals what we really are really permitting to kind of dwell and sit and saturate in the recesses of our heart it will come out and that's why of course we all recognize <laughs> James says our, our tongue is just full of evil. <laughs> and so many times it just reveals how much of that come, comes out. All the more reason, hopefully we can realize this is what Paul is telling us. Um, just as we need to crucify the flesh, we also kind of have to crucify the intent of our minds and kind of crucify what we are kind of giving that green light and openness um, to fill up. So notice again that connection. What we say often is very connected with what we are allowing to dwell and reach our hearts. One final passage, and we'll move on in uh, Romans chapter 12. Um, notice again, we have to make this active, um, active uh, 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 intentionality. If we, just, in other words, it, it, it's purposeful. It's something that we actually make plans. We actually have to sit down and kind of have a game plan for how we're going to fight this, how we're going to combat this. And Romans 12 is a good passage because it even indicates we need to actually sit down and say, how do I retrain my mind? And we need to do that because as we talked about, just, just, a, just casually driving down you know, from, from, from one innocent place to another innocent place or maybe just casually going from one place to the next or casually trying to engage some innocent conversation. Uh, ideas, concepts, thoughts are just thrown at us. You know, even against our best effort to keep them from... Uh, flooding through the avenues of our, our personal home, just engaging uh, with others outside in this world. They're, they're, it's going to kind of splatter. It's going to hit us in different places. And we need to uh, have a kind of a, a game plan for how we're going to do this. And one of the game plans, he says, almost expecting the fact just as, well, if, you know, you, you keep, keep uh, you know, your, your car from, from going to the mo most filthiest places, you know, even... Either you just say, well, I'm going to try and stay on the, you know, the, the clean side of the road. Eventually, you're going to have to go to the car wash. Or you're going to, you're going to have to wash it. You're going to have to clean it somehow. Right? It's not going to stay perfectly clean. You, you avoid uh, just go mudding everywhere. <laughs> you still got to clean it, right? That's the concept of Romans 12. Even if I have no intention of going to the filthiest places, just the fact that I'm kind of around all this, I'm going to have to reset what the natural course of this world kind of splatters on me. We get splattered with it. And so he says, because of that, I have to kind of have a game plan, even with that, to kind of recorrect, renew the effort that I don't want this to influence where I go. He says, because just that has enough influence and ability to do that. Even if we, I have no intention to go to the worst places, just, I'm, just, I'm trying to live just a good, right, right, good life. Well, again, Jesus says, well, where are you going to go where evil isn't present? Where are you going to go where some co topic of conversation doesn't enter your thought? It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to hit us. 
And so that's the idea of Romans chapter 12. Let's, let's keep that in mind as we read this passage. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual servant. Okay, present your bodies clean. How do I present my body clean? Notice what he, the next place he immediately goes, how to keep my body clean? I got to reset my mind. I got to constantly be resetting. And notice what he says in verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I tell you, that, that, that's, that's the thing. Some, I, I get the most frustrated by that because you, you can, it does. It, it just has a way of, it, just, it gets on you. I mean, you say, well, I'm, I'm making every effort not, not to in, intentionally do that, not to intentionally let it be there. What, and I know for me, if I don't have a game plan to effectively, proactively kind of cleanse my thoughts effectively with the washing of the water of the word, it will slowly influence us in ways that we, maybe we thought, I, I never thought I'd, 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 I'd be okay with this, or I'd let my guard down in this area. It just has that way of impacting us. And that's why he says it's, it's crucial. If we're going to keep our bodies in, 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 in tip-top holy position to, to, to use it in the right way and, and, and overcome the temptation, the natural temptations of the flesh, we're going to have to have an intentional uh, game plan of how do I maintain and renew clean thoughts to strengthen this heart so that I can walk effectively. And so as we had, so this is the, initially that's the point, the idea of anything that's filthy, corrupts, just splatters, just pollutes. We got to keep our minds centered. We got to avoid that and wash it and renew it from time to time. And uh, another thing, it says that other passages indicate it's almost a repulsive quality that would awaken disgust in those who are decent. So what happens, just as you would, what happens when, as soon as you, you, know, you, you spend all day cleaning, washing, waxing the car, and then that bird flutters over it and just you know, happens to be, a, what? <laughs> you kidding me? <laughs> You're disgusted by it, right? <laughs> like, one, little, one little section, right? Because you went through all that effort and you're trying to keep it that way. This is naturally, and this is, this is how you know, you know you're on the right track. When you've done this effort, when you've done all the work and you've cleaned house, guess what's going to happen? When just one little, you're like, man, I can't believe, I got to, man, I, I, I got to do something. I got to clean that up again. It's going to instill a vigilance to keep it that way. Notice some, some passages we'll look at. Um, one is First uh, Peter chapter Three. Um, turn to First Peter, uh, chapter three, and let's start reading in verse thirteen. In First Peter chapter three, verse thirteen, he says, "Who is there to harm you if you prove notice zealous for what is good?" Just think, I'm zealous to keep my car clean. I'm zealous to keep it. I'm, 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 I'm maintaining it. I'm washing it. Well, what happens when that spot comes in and hits it? What's your action to that? How do you feel about it? When you're zealous, when you're zealous, when you're determined, I'm, I'm doing everything possible to keep this in good working order. He says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Words, they're having trouble making anything stick to you that does have some kind of defiled kind of concept because you are so zealous that you don't want it even to be named in your character. Words, no, it's, you're so zealous that now your conscience kicks in. So that's their conscience. When, when, when you are so zealous that you've cleaned house and you're trying to maintain it, now you're so zealous that your conscience will be very se sensitive. That it won't be like, well, man, of course, yeah, let, look, look. after all the, the mud and the muck, that, that now the whole thing's covered. I can't even see out the, the back of the windshield. It's, I don't want even one area of defilement. That's kind of the idea he has here. That, that zeal, that even if someone were to, were to conjure up something, they couldn't make it stick. Because your conscience is just so determined to kind of live a certain way. 
And notice he says over in Philippians um, chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. He says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I often told you and now to you even weeping that they are um, enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame. Who, notice, who set their minds on earthly things. But we're different. And verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, when our minds are so... In other words, this, this gives us motivation. Why? Why should we do it? Why should we have... Why, what's the motivation to, to want to flood our minds with the light of goodness and purity and what is clean and good? Because that's Jesus. <laughs> when you're filling your mind with what is good, you're filling your mind with the Lord. He is the light. The light of His goodness, His cleanness, His righteousness, His purity. You literally are letting Him, His content, His character... Well, and if your mind says, that's where I want to dwell for all of eternity and finally be redeemed from having to even uh, be, be uh, tempted to, to compromise these ideas. Notice he says the idea is that we are fighting so hard for that that we have this conscience that allows us to realize that there's certain things that just would be shameful. That we do have, and that's kind of a taboo word, and that what's shameful, or shame on you, or shame on me. Or how, how dare you say, or how, how dare you think that? Some things, that are, is, it's just downright shameful to, to dwell on it, would be shameful to let it continue to conjure and, and, and materialize and, and, and dwell into something bigger. In other words, notice to catch that, that there's certain people that they, they have it in their minds. Not only are they, the, the conscience is, is sensitive, but it's sensitive because they feel they would be ashamed if they let it stay there. And so they have this motivation that they, 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 can't, they can't settle on it being there because it would be shameful because of how much they're devoted to wanting to just be filled with the good of the other attributes of who Christ is. And that's where they really want to be. And they know that's where um, all those who love righteousness will be. So there is a sense of it, it repulses us or should motivate us to turn away from it. And of course the reason for that is because one final attribute. Because it does. It, it separates us from God. Uh, Genesis 6 verses 5 through 8. That was the primary description of the individual that God brought punishment on. Is because their thoughts were continually evil. Always. They, 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 they didn't have any way or motivation to stop it. And let's look at a couple other passages. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And notice in verse 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 19. He says, all of this time you have been thinking that we are defending ourselves to you. Actually, it is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ. And all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I may find you, notice, to be not what I wish. And may be found by you not to be what you you wish. Which is kind of interesting. Paul is really stating, he's saying, I'm giving you fair warning. And I say, now there's a lot of things that I, I, I'm, I'm prayerfully hoping that you will address. And you'll be zealous, zealous to get rid of it. To change and repent. He says, I'm, I'm giving you kind of fair warning. He says, now well, I'm going to come. I'm going to show up physically. He said, I'm going to kind of, kind of assess where you're at. And he says, if I find certain things that you haven't changed from, you may not be all that excited to have me in your presence. <laughs> I may be giving you kind of sermon that's going to sting. And it's not going to be just lovey, hey, Paul, laugh it up, goof around, Paul. <laughs> it's going to be, I can't believe you're not ashamed of this. What, 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 why aren't you ashamed of this? Why, why aren't you making more of an effort to not let this affect you? And that's... So there's certain things. What's the list? There's a list of things. You know, and again, he's giving them fair warning. He said, I, I know you struggle. I know, I know these are issues. But listen, we, we really, we have to 
make an effort to fight this. So he says, so now, I hope I don't see this when I come to you. What is, what is he afraid he might see? Well, I might find that there's strife. He dealt with that, right? Stop fighting. Let's get along, love each other. If I see, if I see when I get there, I'm going to tell you what. <laughs> We're going to deal with this. Jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. Notice what he says. He says, I am afraid. That when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you. Kind of is humiliating. When you just write, you just say, what's wrong? Come on. It's kind of what he's saying. He said, I might be tempted to act like that. (laughs) Sometimes we have to, right? We have to out of love, right? When we're just like, you know better than this. (laughs) Come on. Don't don't let the devil continue to, you know, you're better than that, right? You've, you've, you've You've done so good. Don't shrink back. He says, now my God may humiliate me before you. And I may mourn over many of those who have sinned in the past and not repented of the impurity and the immorality and the sensuality which they have practiced. He said, that's why he's trying to say, no, I, know how, he says, I know, I know how hard this is. Believe me, Paul says, I, I recognize this is difficult. All the more reason that we have to put, make that much more of an effort to fight the war for what saturates this. And, and what he's saying is he's, he's hoping he doesn't come and find Christians who are just kind of lukewarm about it. Like, well, I don't really care to fight it. It's not a big deal. He's saying, no, we, we should be zealous to say, Let's, let's guard our, our hearts. Let's try to make the effort to, to keep these things from affecting us. Because they do. They have a way of, of, of growing in, into, into deeper, bigger problems in our life. So that's the third element. The reason um, why we should have that zeal and motivation is because. And that's why he says, he says, because if we don't repent, it's going to put us in jeopardy. And that's why, of course, he would get that way. He would get there because of his love and his zeal. He loved these Corinthians. He worked so hard to help these Corinthians become children of God. And that's why he was doing it. He said, I, I, just, I care so much about you that I, I want to make sure that you recognize how dangerous some of these things are and that you, you are properly encouraged to keep from them. And one final point. Let us just examine ourselves. That's the best we can do just constantly just examine ourselves, see where we're at. Do we need extra help? Do we need extra barriers? Do we need uh, maybe more influx of the word, maybe less influx of certain other areas of, that we allow these things to come and, and, and compromise where we are? And so, uh, but that is about the, just where I kind of end our lesson on that point. Uh, but that's, that's, the, that's the danger of impurity is um, what goes... And it tends to influence what goes out. It very rarely just kind of stays there. And sometimes it can very easy, right? Sometimes Satan tempts us to compromise it. Well, there's just this compartment. I just keep it in there and I just bottle up. And it doesn't affect what I do. And sometimes, you know, we can maybe be good at, at guarding that for a while. But eventually, that's why he says we've got to cleanse and re-cleanse and re-examine uh, where we're at just to make sure that we are being led in the right direction. So if anyone is with us who's never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, we plead for you, we pray for you, that, that you would be encouraged by faith to trust that, uh, number one, hopefully you recognize, right, where, where are we going to go? We're not going to be affected or not going to be uh, tempted or, or compromised by sin in this area. Oh, we're all guilty of it. We all, that's why Jesus came to provide that antidote, to provide that much-needed blood so that we could be cleansed of the sin that has corrupted us and polluted us. So don't be ashamed of the fact that you might need to admit, yeah, I'm guilty. Accept the gift of the Savior. Accept the gift of forgiveness. That by faith, Jesus says, if you come and you confess that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, turning away from these things, are willing to be baptized, washed, buried in water so that his blood can cleanse and redeem you 
make us clean in his sight. Whatever impure uh, nature has corrupted you, whatever level of impurity you may be guilty of, the blood of Jesus can wash it completely away and make us clean. And he can continue to work with us and teach us. And that's what he's teaching us here is going to be a, a guide for us to help us learn how we can keep ourselves from being corrupted by these things once we've come out of the waters of baptism to walk with him. So if anyone needs to be baptized, to be uh, washed, to be made clean, please come forward. We'll gladly help and assist you while we stand and sing the song of encouragement.